It is a very great uh, pleasure to me to be uh, here after uh, such a great uh, keynote speeches uh, of Minister uh, Martini and uh, Lieutenant General uh, Shapro. Uh, it's really a hard task uh, to start a discussion about the most uh, pressing issues and questions about transatlantic uh, relations, the future of NATO, and how geopolitics uh, is essential in our uh, future in every sense after these uh, great ideas and topics what have uh, already mentioned. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, introduce our uh, speakers of the panel discussion. Uh, Ms. Miriam uh, Lexman uh, serves, serves as the uh, director of the EU Office of the International Republican uh, Institute in Brussels, and uh, she previously served as the permanent representative of the uh, Slovak Parliament uh, in the European Union, and her uh, main field of interest is uh, uh, international democracy support, and uh, I presume uh, one of our most pressing issues even uh, within the uh, framework of NATO as well as the European uh, Union is how to build up resilience and how to preserve our values uh, in democracy as well as transatlantic uh, values uh, as such, so I'm pretty sure uh, she will be able to add uh, great uh, ideas and, and uh, added value to your uh, discussion. And uh, next to her uh, sits uh, head of uh, our transatlantic office as well as uh, head of research of the anti Josef Knowledge Center, uh, Tomasz Peter uh, Barani. He's uh, a Cold War historian. Uh, as well as a member of task force uh, led by the Hungarian uh, Institute for Foreign Affairs and uh, Trade to figure out what is necessary to be done in order to uh, enhance uh, the European defense initiatives, uh, the PESCO and the EDF. That's why uh, I think uh, it's a really good uh, pick to have Tomasz here to talk about uh, these uh, pressing issues of European uh, defense. Uh, my first question to both of our uh, speakers uh, would be, uh, I would like to start with the macro perspective and uh, go into the details uh, further. So first of all, I would like to ask you, how uh, shall we imagine the term transatlantic uh, values and uh, how would you define it uh, as uh, as far as the introductory speeches are concerned, uh, our director Peter Antal just mentioned his father, how Josef Antal uh, perceived transatlantic uh, values uh, in the late 90s. And of course, uh, we have the feeling that uh, today's young generation, the millennials, have, might have a different perspective on uh, what we uh, would think on uh, transatlantic values as such. So first of all, I'd like to ask uh, Miriam, how would you define uh, values? I will speak in English now, but hello, good afternoon or good morning. I will not focus on the, on the values as such, but I will maybe define the transatlantic alliance in a uh, in few key uh, words. And I will speak of two myths, one challenge and one problem. And the two myths, uh, maybe the first myth I would like to mention is that which, which is mainly um, supported by media and is that, that the United States no longer supports democracy worldwide and that the United States is uh, withdrawing from the world. And, and maybe here the problem is that when you look at the president and when you look at the Congress and the leading politicians, you will see maybe a dichotomy which is contradicting each other on certain issues. But maybe just because I work in an area of democracy support, I can confirm that the United States is clearly still supporting democracy. It's, it's a partner of the European Union, it's a partner of, the, of Europe, and it's partner of every person in the world who wishes to live in a free and democratic world. I, I work for an organization, the International Republican Institute, which is financed by the American taxpayers. And the, the other myths related to this is that there is less money going to democracy support in the United States worldwide. I can tell you that there is more money. You would also hear very often 
the comparison about how much money is put in democracy support and development and comparing the EU and the US, where you see the numbers of the EU much higher. But I would say that this is also a little myth with the EU is using in its own advantage because the, the support to democracy and freedom of every person in the world coming from the US is not only going through the state budget and the taxpayers' money, but the US is doing far more through different voluntary organizations, private sector support, and churches, which is very often forgotten when we talk about democracy support, how much the different churches supported by communities in the US are doing worldwide. So I think this is something which needs to be recognized and which needs to be remembered. The second myth is that if Russia stops interfering into our democracies, our democracies will be healthy. And I would turn this around. We are told, it was already mentioned by, by the General uh, Shepo, the disinformation and the hybrid war. But an International Republican Institute is studying the hybrid war and especially focusing on disinformation very, very strongly. And what we realize is that the uh, that the fertile ground of disinformation, mainly disinformation, is actually within us. And unless we address these issues, we are not able to stop Russia interfering, or also other countries like ISIS, or, or no, it's not the country, but the other actors like ISIS or country like China. So what is very important is to, to build the resilience of our democracies, and to address the, the democratic gaps and vulnerabilities of our own democracies in order to make democracies healthier. And that would stop the interference because the interference will be obsolete or not efficient. The challenge in transatlantic relations is obvious. Uh, obviously, the, the EU and, and the US is that the EU is not a country. And obviously, this br brings lots of challenges. There is the kind of famous challenge of, uh, of Ms. Uh, what Mr. K Kissinger has mentioned, uh, what is the phone number of the uni European Union. But I think this challenge later on is becoming, in a way, less important because we see that the European Union, on a certain level, is acting more co coherently on an international level. And here I come to the last point I want to mention, and is the one problem. And the one problem is that our moral, moral weaknesses of the West are becoming far more visible in the global world. And Mr. Martoni was talking, for example, about trade. Our moral weaknesses about how we do trade in the global trade economy are becoming more, more visible, but also turning against us. And there is a lot of double standards as well. And for example, I would mention one, which is related to the transatlantic alliance and the way how we, how we address the challenges coming from Russia. General Shepo was mentioning that Russia, uh, during the Cold War, the Soviet Union during the Cold War was our enemy, then became partner. It's still officially a partner, but now we see that it's becoming, Russia is becoming an enemy. But in order to address the enemy, we have to be morally united and we cannot allow any double standards. And I see, I mean, I will use one example, which is on one hand, we have, we have uh, sanctions against Russia, but on the other hand, the biggest economic deal be, being the Nord Stream 2 is being managed at the sa very same time. And this is exactly what I want to, to mention is that the moral, uh, incoherence in our action is turning against us and we have to address those first in order to strengthen the alliance. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning for all of you. Uh, thank you very much for coming. As, uh, as far as I'm also a host and also a guest, then it's also my duty to say uh, hello and thank you for uh, your presence here. Uh, being a speaker here is uh, sort of a humble experience for me, especially after those uh, wonderful keynote speeches that basically uh, popped up all the relevant issues, questions uh, that could be possibly, you know, think of. Um, but uh, getting back to straight to the point, um, so what about what are the transatlantic values? How could we define them? 
me as a Cold War historian as well as someone who deals with NATO and European defense issues on a daily basis, or uh, if you can say so, uh, I see uh, a lot of continuities and a lot of disruptions in this field. Uh, when the Transatlantic Alliance uh, was uh, formed, uh, the situation was much easier. Uh, by then, back then, uh, the transatlantic relation still had two halves, as, as it does today as well, uh, but it was easier to put the two together. In Europe, the situation was quite easier. Um, the common values were more clearly defined. Uh, it was a general sense that we should put a totalitarian experience, uh, experiments behind us, uh, that we should concentrate on strong national communities, strong regionalism, subsidiarity, um, and uh, we should build up moral as well as physical defense uh, against, for example, the Soviet encroachment uh, and the like. The United States, in turn, um, was a major uh, supporter in both the moral and the technical issues in this alliance. Uh, unspoken, but present were Christian values. Um, this is the period when Christian democratic parties uh, ruled Europe uh, throughout. The very idea of European integration as well as transatlantic alliance uh, was based on, a, on the ideas of a handful of Christian democrat politicians. All this started to change a little in the 1970s and then a lot more in the 1990s when there was integration projects were expanded and transformed into something more or something different than a club of Christian democratic uh, governments. Um, and then came federalist ideas uh, and the need to get beyond the nation state. And those things uh, are you know, very heavily uh, in our own uh, attempts at defining European values. Uh, this is pretty much uh, in line with what you say, Miriam, uh, that uh, in this case there is, a, there is a contradiction within Europe, so not only, uh, so it's not really an American-European issue, it is within Europe. That is why it is pretty hard sometimes to define those values, uh, but the very core we can uh, we can all agree with uh, is a certain commitment to democratic ideals, a certain commitment at least for the time being for, for uh, a Europe based on nation states. And uh, this is obviously threatened uh, by many factors. Those factors we have, we have ignored for, for, for quite some years. Um, the hard different issues we've heard about that uh, have been ignored for quite some time, some time, but now they are making their return. Uh, one particularly important question about the transatlantic values is um, how certain European ideas might create an environment that uh, would possibly push the United States in a more isolationist stance. I'm referring to it because uh, I'm, I'm quite sure we will talk about this later, but uh, some of the extreme forms and ideas of European defense uh, have uh, put some alarm on in Washington, D.C., and uh, uh, the namesake of our institution, the first democratically elected prime minister, Joseph Antal, uh, already sensed this problem. In one of his speeches in 1991, I think, uh, he made this speech, and he warned the Hungarian um, constituencies, the constituencies of, its part, of his party, uh, that uh, the responsibility of the center parties are huge, are enormous uh, throughout uh, Europe and, and also in Hungary, uh, because we shouldn't let uh, any extremes to become so powerful in Europe that might advocate some decoupling of the European defense from the transatlantic alliance because this might push the United States to a more isolationist 
tendency. And this, uh, Mr. Jose Pantel said in 1991, uh, this is still true and still very valuable. Uh, so the basic idea behind uh, my expose is the transatlantic values have always been hard to define, but the concentration on the center parties and the concentration on Europe's need not to let the United States decouple from its defense is a point in case. Thank you. I would like to uh, continue our discussion uh, with a uh, clear connection to your last uh, sentence mentioning the importance of uh, avoiding decoupling and keep the Americans uh, into, uh, interested in terms of, of European uh, defense as a European. Uh, I find this uh, perspective really uh, important. So my second question would be, uh, revolving around the question of uh, credibility of NATO, because if you look back uh, to the 1990s, after the collapse of the Soviet Union without a clear uh, competitor, uh, European member states started to use the so-called peace dividend in order to uh, uh, cope with uh, economic struggles and use uh, the money allocated uh, formerly uh, on defense uh, budgets in order to build welfare societies. It's kind of understandable from a perspective of a politician, of course, and without a clear uh, competitor, it's uh, pretty understandable as such. But uh, what is the title of uh, today's conference, uh, geopolitics and uh, the revival of uh, geopolitical actors in, 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 in uh, world politics and international space. I'd like to uh, ask you about how do you see uh, today's uh, initiatives to uh, revive uh, NATO commitments and uh, to make NATO uh, relevant again in terms of, of uh, showing uh, credibility. What do we need uh, to achieve this in terms of uh, foreign policy and European-American relations in general and uh, uh, focusing on, on uh, exact security policy steps uh, in particular? I will maybe use a couple of examples. And I think the credibility of NATO has suffered Maybe first when there was this uh, cyber attack on, on um, Estonia and NATO wasn't able to, to react because that time people didn't think about this kind of attacks and, and NATO took some time to define if this was an attack and wasn't an attack and what kind of attacks are actually taken in account. So maybe the, some kind of inefficiency or in addressing new challenges and new warfare is a, is it was lacking in order to, to support the credibility of NATO. The second example maybe I would use that I come from Slovakia and it was discussed late, later in the, in the news that practically Slovakia being a NATO member is still buying equipment, military equipment from Russia which is not compatible with the equipment other countries are, are buying. And this is not only problem of Slovakia, this is problem of many NATO member states that there is no efficiently uh, managed what kind of equipment which countries are, are buying and how they are, they are coordinated. So I think that uh, some kind of coordination is one thing which would probably, uh, probably increase ef uh, efficiency and that will also increase the the, the way how the money for, for um, military equipment is spent. Because it's not only the question about how much countries are spending, and we all, always see these questions, how much people are able to spend and if they, are, if they are able to see that there is a threat and the threat or the defense or their security costs something. But on the other hand, we also have to see how efficiently manage the money, and I think this is sometimes missing in the discussion. And, uh, and maybe the second, second example, uh, I mean, I will again use an example from Slovakia because it's, it's a recent example where practically there is a huge discussion that the, that the government has approved a new security and defense policy of the Slovak Republic, which is actually the old one is uh, like nearly 20 years old. So there is a new policy which was approved by the government, but but then because of the 
I would say, some internal political issues within the government. Uh, this document was put aside and was not approved by the parliament. And now we were some experts on defense and security and, and international affairs. We are writing an appeal, most of us actually being in opposition, we are writing an appeal uh, to the, for the government to actually bring back this document, approve this document, which, which is absolutely necessary nowadays, and especially after the, the new, uh, new attacks of Russia on Ukraine. And there was a huge discussion about, because the document talks about we have to stick to our values, we have to be based on our values, we have to revive our values. The, the document had, I don't know, 30 times the, the word values. And I said to the experts, but, well, according to the IRI polling, we have a big issue because when you ask people, what do you think actually the transatlantic values are? What are the European values? People have no idea. So I wrote, we have to write that these values are based on a Judeo-Christian uh, heritage. And then there was suddenly a huge discussion because many people didn't agree with that. And they were saying, well, but it's not only Christian, it's also other heritage, and, it's, and maybe the Christian. And, it's, and, and, and I think this is exactly what is missing, is that we are talking about some kind of values, we are tr talking about alliance, but if we do not base this alliance on a very clearly defined values, the, va the alliance will be very weak. And I think this is the biggest problem, that we are unable to agree what are the foundations of our alliance. Um, okay, I, I think I would divide this, this question into two, because there is, a, there is a hard part of it and there is a soft part of it. Uh, we should make a tribute to the hard part as well. So I think you touched upon the 2% issue. Um, uh, it has a lot to do with, with, with NATO's credibility, uh, which the, the very fact that now the United States uh, is adamant in uh, demanding the 2% defense minimum, and the thing that Europe has so far reacted uh, um, quite positively to it, or, or, or they indeed embarked on uh, more defense spending, uh, is obviously a good thing uh, in terms of uh, NATO capacities, in terms of uh, the, the, the deterrence NATO uh, can create. But uh, this also makes the picture more complicated in many ways, uh, as, as we will, I'm quite sure I will discuss this further. Um, you know, an increased, increased defense budget plus um, the new European frameworks, uh, like talks of a European common army, uh, the PESCO, uh, the European Defence Fund, it could create a situation where national defences uh, cannot any longer be grasped exclusively in terms of NATO. That doesn't necessarily mean a lot, uh, but that's a fact and that's a novelty. Uh, but so far, for the credibility of NATO in terms of hard security, uh, but joining uh, to what has just Miriam said, uh, equally important is the soft security or, or soft deterrence, if one may say something like that. Um, so what we shall see is what we are facing uh, cannot be deterred uh, with tanks or with Trident Juncture war games. Um, in most cases, what, we, what uh, the Alliance faces are cyber attacks uh, or attacks on values, attacks on the density of, uh, of, of the Alliance that cannot be obviously uh, countered with a military buildup. So that is why a clear formulation of the policy goals of the alliance, uh, the moral grounding of the alliance, uh, is also very necessary in order to move forward. And that is why I, I appreciate a lot uh, the work that you do, you do at the IRI, uh, because you try to highlight this very problem uh, we often forget about, how important it is. But I think uh, such a Soft, such soft measures in NATO would be equally important than a hard military buildup. And this is also a problem within NATO. I mean, this problem, they, 
they know, but they are aware of this problem. That is why they struggle with uh, NATO public diplomacies. Uh, they try to, um, the alliance tries to improve and enhance their measures to reach out to the public. Uh, they wish to reach out to the younger generation, um, particularly. And this uh, uh, has so far uh, brought uh, modest results. Uh, partly because those are complicated and technical issues that are you know, not pretty easy to publicize. Um, but still, uh, there is the effort and uh, this effort should be strengthened and uh, should be further supported. You know, reaching out to the public, tell them what NATO is about, why NATO is important, what are the, what are the alternatives uh, of a strong uh, commitment to NATO. Uh, and uh, also, this cannot be detached from a clear formulation and a clear endorsement of, uh, of the values it is founded on. Thank you very much. Uh, my next question, uh, I would like to focus on the, uh, let's not be so blunt, but let's put it that way, the divide. Uh, of uh, the European partners and the United States in a sense of how we and them and them and we perceive what is needed to be not done in terms of, uh, of uh, new NATO initiatives. And uh, to explain uh, this uh, expose, I had uh, a personal experience with uh, listening to discussion uh, at the Warsaw Security Forum this October with uh, one young lady, a director from uh, Berlin, uh, representative of Centrum für Sicherheitspolitik, and uh, Jan Brzezinski coming from the Atlantic Center. And uh, they were discussing about uh, the situation when uh, Donald Trump, uh, not the first uh, president of the United States, but the next one uh, in the line to uh, ask for deeper commitment from European uh, partners in terms of defense spending, while uh, the German representative uh, was constantly talking about her critiques in terms of uh, Washington uh, as they decided uh, to deal uh, with Polish military bases and American uh, troop deployment in the territory of Poland without uh, the consent, not consent, but without involving NATO framework and do it on a bilateral basis. Uh, not forget to, and uh, they have not forget to mention uh, the fact uh, how, for example, the unilateral uh, withdrawal from the INF Treaty by the United States can threaten the whole European uh, security architecture. And seeing these trends uh, and then the concrete uh, steps from the uh, Trump administration uh, can be uh, can create some concerns uh, on the European side as well as uh, mentioning uh, again and again uh, the need of commitment in terms of the 2%, uh, after a while can be a bit uh, harmful. I would like to ask you about, uh, to comment uh, these uh, most pressing issues of, of European-American uh, divide, if it is uh, any. Uh, so, please, I would like to pass the floor. Yes, I would maybe say that the problem probably is not that we see things differently, but the problem is that different sides and in both in the United States and in Europe are using these problems and maybe kind of disagreements on a certain solutions into different pol for different political or economic or whatever uh, agendas. For example, you mentioned, Peter, the 2% the issue. The 2% issue was kind of brought in a very typical and special way by President Trump in his own kind of rhetorics. And I think it was clear that, that it was still clear that the United States supports NATO, doesn't want NATO to be dissolved, but wants Europe to adhere to its commitments. And this was used by many American media, whatever, opposition to President Trump, against President Trump, saying that President Trump is uh, ruining the, the NATO, ruining the, 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 the alliance, and ruining the cooperation between the United States and Europe. So we were not addressing the problem. The issue which, yes, there is an issue, the European countries are not adhering to their own promises and pledges, how much should be spent for, for security. That was an issue which was supposed to be 
dealt with, but instead we were dealing about the issue which was a fictional issue that the Trump, that the President of the United States is against NATO or doesn't like NATO or doesn't see the importance. The second thing is Russia. As it was already said by many speakers previously, Russia was a partner, became a threat. This has happened and I think most of us will agree on that. And what happened is, I remember after the, the last elections in Russia, I was watching, I don't remember which, which one of the big international channels, well, how they were informing about the, the results of the elections in Russia. And I was thinking like if, if an ordinary person looks at this uh, report about the elections in Russia and would still remember the report about the elections in the United States, that was, I don't know, one and a half years ago then, would think that the United States democracy is weaker than the democracy in Russia. The report about Russia was this has happened, that many people came to the vote. You know, it was very ordinary report. Rather than during the last presidential elections in the United States, the, the media were reporting the elections as if it was an end of democracy in the United States. And I think this is a problem, that we are not addressing a threat, we are using the different threats into our different political agendas. And if this stops happening, then maybe we'll be able to address, and of course, I mean, there are differences, there are different approaches, there are different priorities. This is absolutely normal, but we have to really focus on the actual issues rather than, and give up our own internal fight, because this, will ma this makes us weaker, and this will, will miss the time when we can prepare for the threats which are coming, and it's not only Russia, but we know about threats from China and other, other geopolitical or, or, or actors in the world, and I think this makes us weaker. Thank you. Okay, so uh, trying to put focus on uh, possible European-American differences uh, within NATO. I mean, the, the root causes are, of course, as always, uh, yes, geography. Uh, once uh, the whole panel or the whole conference uh, is about uh, the importance of geopolitics, obviously, the United States is much bigger. Uh, it's in a different geographical location, uh, the different status, uh, has a tendency to see things differently than the rest of the NATO countries uh, notice that among the continental NATO countries, the strategic perceptions tend to diverge as well. In many cases, there are countries uh, that are more anti-Russian in their posture, that there are those who are less, there are those who, who primarily focus on uh, near and Middle Eastern issues. Um, so never forget that those strategic perceptions are diverging. Uh, it is uh, more than natural, then uh, it, is, it is different in, a little in the case of the United States as well. Uh, one outstanding issue is uh, the attitude towards uh, a certain degree of European strategic autonomy uh, and also how much NATO should move into a direction more into that of the European defense or more like an interventionist force. Uh, but this is also not pretty much agreed on in, in, on a European level. The French uh, are, for instance, also uh, have this interventionist idea in many cases. Uh, but this is far from being a settled issue, uh, but it, it, it is undeniably it's kind of a rift. Uh, but also, uh, if uh, we already brought up the idea of how the Trump administration's attitudes, policies uh, might affect uh, such a divide uh, or such differences of opinion, um, I would like to make uh, my opinion clear in, on two points. Uh, the divide between uh, Europe and the US, if we can call it divide, uh, is not a product of the Trump administration. Uh, it, is, it has been highlighted by some of the rhetorics of uh, the Trump administration at best, uh, but, it's, but actually um, it is a more complicated uh, relationship that uh, what, I, what I've told about uh, it is coming from, it's a crew from geography. Uh, and the Trump administration itself has an underlying duality of approach uh, to this issue. Uh, 
um, because many of you have noticed uh, in some critical remarks about NATO, about Article 5 during the 2016 presidential campaign in the US and also afterwards in some cases, um, you know, special uh, kind of rhetorics that has that, that we have not noticed before from an American president. Uh, and also the tendency of the Trump administration to value bilateral or, or sometimes even unilateral uh, decisions over multilateral internationalism. But I, this latter is certainly true. This is one of the key policy uh, changes the Trump administration brought. But I would like to draw the attention to the fact that uh, NATO, uh, in this sense, has been given a preferential treatment. So it's not like the TTIP, it's not like NAFTA, it's uh, not like many other things, the, the Iron Deal, uh, which was decided uh, or downgraded unilaterally by the United States. Uh, NATO, uh, notwithstanding, the, the increased importance of, of bilateral and unilateral uh, things. NATO has uh, remained the cornerstone of American uh, defense and foreign policy. And uh, this is why I say it, is, it has been given a preferential treatment uh, in this new uh, fashion of bilateralism as well. Um, as I said, there is a duality of approach because NATO uh, is often criticized from the US on, on the basis of unfair burden sharing, uh, but it, is, uh, it has never been criticized uh, for what NATO is in fact and what NATO does. So the criticism is, is uh, if we take the bigger picture, targets uh, the fact that NATO could be better at the same, in the same goals, in the same uh, activities it already does. Um, if we uh, set aside you know, the domestic political considerations, set aside rhetorical uh, exaggerations, what we see uh, so far is a renewed US commitment to NATO resulted in increased defense budgets throughout Europe increased number of American troops in the eastern flank of, uh, of NATO. Uh, actually, it is, uh, it is measured by, by the thousands, so it's not even a, not even a small uh, reinforcement. Uh, so while many people consider Trump as, uh, the Trump administration as something of anti-NATO, the facts show that uh, the alliance has grown in, uh, in number as well as um, money uh, in terms of hard defense. So this, is, this duality of approach uh, is sometimes you know, uh, blurring our views, uh, but the tendencies, if we take the bigger picture, are pretty clear. The, the, the United States takes NATO still as a cornerstone of its defense and foreign policy. Thank you very much. Uh, one short uh, technical information that uh, because uh, Miriam have to uh, leave early in uh, 15 minutes, I would like to uh, start the uh, last round of questions. Uh, so I have my own question for you for the last time. And uh, after that, I would like to pass the floor uh, to the audience. So please prepare your uh, ideas and thoughts and please uh, be interactive and post questions to our uh, distinguished uh, speakers. So my last question to you would be, uh, we previously mentioned the permanent structured cooperation and, and the prospects uh, from the European uh, Defense Agency. How do you perceive the future of uh, uh, European defense initiatives in a sense of uh, there is still a great debate if uh, we Europeans shall include uh, other partners in the PESCO project such as the United States and uh, London uh, after Brexit is still up to question. And my second question would be uh, related also to this topic. What can uh, East Central European countries do in terms of uh, strengthening European defense? Because uh, if you look at the plans, at least four and five uh, countries uh, 
consisting uh, consortium is needed to be able to acquire two potential EU grants and uh, funds to make uh, military development projects. And how do you see it? Uh, is there any useful platform, such as, for example, the Visegrad Corporation, or bigger platforms uh, as the as the three C's initiatives, with uh, obviously a different original focus, uh, to be uh, able to be a platform uh, and and a vehicle uh, to be part of PESCO projects, or is it uh, a theater for the big players such as France and Germany? Uh, yeah. I'm not a defense specialist, so I will be very brief. I just believe that in order to have an efficient defense, we have to be inclusive rather than exclusive. So I would seek such solutions also for the European Union, which will be including partners within, within the alliance. But I would say that pr practically the problem also is that the alliance has run into a problem that even some of the members, and, and now n n mainly Turkey, is an issue for, for the rest of the, the members. So, and the European Union has to kind of, when, when building up the defense, we have to operate within the current situation. I would still make it as, as a, ex, <coughs> inclusive as possible. And the inclusivity should be within the European Union. So the countries like the countries of the Visegrad 4 and the platform like the Visegrad 4 should be guaranteed a voice and strength because the alliance is not going to function if it's going to be run only by certain strong countries, especially because the international preferences and the foreign policy preferences are still very diverse and we see it on, on er, many issues. So in case the, the defense policy is going to be run by two, three strong countries, and while the foreign, European foreign policy is still running by the member states because it's not pushed completely on the EU level, then we will, we will have a problem. So I think we, will be, we have to be very careful and kind of harmonize it with our foreign policy, which mean, means maybe that the defense policy will make small steps at the beginning, but I think that the kind of a inclusive uh, approach and approach looking at the uh, what are we trying to achieve very clearly it may, will make it more efficient, even though maybe slow. Well, yes, so uh, those newer frameworks of European defense, uh, we've already brought this issue up before, uh, but although uh, in a, in a tang tangential way only. Um, now we should really discuss some of key, me key measures or, or, or uh, key significance. Uh, I think those measures, especially at the beginning, uh, had a dangerous element or, 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 or something of a dangerous potential. Uh, I mean, no one denies the need for uh, a European army uh, or a certain degree of European strategic autonomy. But uh, such moves obviously uh, strengthened the voice of those who, for different reasons, were not a huge friend of NATO within the European Union. Um, this connects me back to my earlier thoughts. Uh, this is, those are parties uh, outside of the center. Uh, <clears throat> But it's not only that, there were several occasions where for domestic political re reasons, uh, one tried to put some, some sort of anti-American uh, agenda into it. Uh, but I think this phase has in, in, in PESCO and the EDF uh, is largely over. The, the most important issue right now is how to deal with third countries. Uh, one should see that if one creates a European defense fund special, specifically designed to enhance European uh, defense industry, and then letting in countries that are NATO members but not EU members, that includes the United Kingdom as well, uh, so if one does so, the whole meaning of the project can be questioned because then why it is not a NATO fund again? 
uh, but still one cannot exclude completely those countries that are uh, NATO members but not EU members uh, because those defense industries uh, tend to be much more developed and much more ready uh, to, to take part uh, in this build-up or uh, in those developments. So the issue is, is far from being simple, uh, actually. One has to uh, admit that without some of those, uh, some of those major military industries, n n no huge reinvigoration can be, can be possible in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, so, so much for the technical issues. Uh, Maybe, maybe uh, later I will, I will speak something else. But now uh, I would like to address what Miriam said. Miriam just said that he, she was not a defense expert, but you actually grasped the gist of, of this whole issue. Uh, because such attempts, uh, such designs uh, that are underlying uh, the, these new frameworks of European defense uh, can can easily turn out to be a vehicle uh, to, to, refer, to, to institutionalize a two-speed Europe. A two, the two-speed Europe, which, uh, which, is which is obviously detrimental to the whole European Union, to the, to the, to the uh, transatlantic alliance, uh, to the whole idea of the Western co cooperation. And if you divide countries, uh, the European countries, into those whose uh, defense industries uh, run high, uh, run effectively, and those who are smaller nations with limited defense cap capabilities, it also adds up to, to already existing notions of the Europe that, are, that, is, that is too speeded. Um, so we Hungarians are pretty much against uh, <laughs> such ideas. I'm not telling you that uh, EDF or PESCO uh, is about that, but the fact that it could have been easily turned out to be a vehicle for that. Uh, it, uh, it hadn't happened, and hopefully it, w it will not, but this is uh, one particular point in which uh, the Hungarian interests are clear, and uh, it's pretty much in line uh, with most of our friends in Europe. Um, so I think this is, this is one of the key issues in that, so you shouldn't let, mm, you know, decoupled from the other part of Europe uh, either, not only from the US, but from the other part of Europe either. Um, for how, how, to, how to make tenders or how to, how to take part in the PESCO cooperation, uh, it's largely technical issues. Uh, but uh, to begin with, I think uh, breaking together Visegrad countries uh, is a good start although uh, our defense industries, defense capabilities are not really complementary, so there should be one, uh, one, one at least or two uh, Western European countries as well. Uh, but in this sense, it does make more sense because uh, more interoperability, uh, more, uh, a more common outlook on, on, on foreign policy issues uh, are imperatives in the V4 region, and uh, if I already mentioned the, how those things could have been turned negative, I say it could turn to be a positive things for the V4 cooperation uh, in first uh, in the defense and later on other policy fields as well. Uh, so it can be used for good, so I think uh, let's use it for good, and also uh, it can be a great avenue for furthering cooperation with Germany as well, and also uh, we, uh, Germany's role in this whole idea was very positive because Germany was one of the major uh, European countries uh, with developed uh, defense industries that would not let, in any case, uh, the Eastern European countries be dropped of, uh, of this uh, initiative. So we are very grateful about that. And also, uh, I think uh, a closer cooperation with this country would be highly beneficial for us. Thank you very much. Uh, now we still have uh, a bit of time uh, for a few questions. So if you would like to ask uh, something from our speakers, please uh, tell your name, affiliation, and uh, please remain uh, brief because we only have uh, 
five to ten uh, minutes for the questions. Okay, uh, if there is no uh, question, uh, I would like to uh, thank the participation of our uh, guests uh, in the first panel. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Miriam Lexman, and thank you very much, uh, Tomasz Peter Borani, for uh, being here with us. And I would like to invite you uh, for uh, a lunch break. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.